for this bill is not a strike-breaking, union-busting bill. You're the best argument I know for it. Bob Kennedy and John Kennedy hated the mafia all out of proportion, and the mafia hated them right back. You roll in, your head down, you shoot up, keeping your head down so if they start hitting you, you protect them. That was the perfect mob hit. The people had, that had so much to gain and, and had such a material motive for putting me in a position I'm in will never let the true facts come above board to the, to the world. Now these people are in very high positions, Jack? Yes. This is Jack Ruby in a little-known snippet of interview saying that the American crime of the century is being covered up by a conspiracy. And in the next hour, we're going to examine evidence, some of it never before publicized, that we hope will leave you clear, at long last, about who was responsible. We believe a preponderance of the evidence indicates that the Kennedy assassination was a mafia hit. I'm Jonathan Quitney, and our subject on this edition of the Quitney Report is the assassination of President Kennedy, a crime that changed our lives. Polls show that most Americans think the killers got away, but our government, which still pursues World War II crimes, isn't pursuing this crime. The compelling evidence has been lost in confusion. Confusion reigned in Dallas on November 22, 1963, clearly shown by this montage of films and panicked radio reports. And in the 25 years since then, the confusion hasn't dimmed. Conspiracy theorists have taken aim at the Warren Commission findings from every direction. So far, none of the theorists has been able to sell the public on any single solution contrary to the official one, that Lee Harvey Oswald was a lone left-wing nut who killed Kennedy without help, and that Jack Ruby was another lone nut who killed Oswald, spontaneously and out of sympathy with the Kennedy family. So far, arguments with the Warren Commission have focused on evidence that we here, like most of you, have found hopelessly inconclusive. For example, slow motion films and electronically enhanced sound tapes. Some people say they prove there was a second gunman, and other people say they don't. Diagrams of bullet trajectories, pictures of entry and exit wounds, test firings of Oswald's gun. Some experts say this proves Oswald fired all the shots, while other experts with just as many PhDs say the same evidence proves that Oswald couldn't possibly have fired the shots. So let's forget all this. Also set aside for the moment the matter of Kennedy's sex life and his efforts to assassinate Fidel Castro. Both matters, it now seems clear, did prompt a cover-up of certain facts after the assassination, but in solving the murder, they are red herrings. They only add to the confusion. Adding further to the confusion, many well-known conspiracy theorists have blown the word of an occasional contrary witness all out of proportion. Every trial lawyer knows that witnesses to big sudden events will honestly differ over what happened. We have satisfied ourselves that there is overwhelming evidence that Oswald did shoot both President Kennedy and Dallas police officer J.D. Tippett, and that the occasional contrary evidence is no more than exists in any big case. But that's where the Warren Commission stopped. We think it's just the beginning. Many people have been linked to the assassination by various conspiracy theorists, but we know for certain that two people did commit crimes in Dallas that weekend, Lee Oswald and Jack Ruby. If one could show a unifying link between the two, surely that link would have become the focus of the investigation. The Warren Commission pictured them as lone wolves because, for reasons we'll explain later, the FBI never told the Warren Commission the pertinent facts. But the link between Oswald and Ruby did exist, and his name was Carlos Marcello. Carlos Marcello uh, is the boss, uh, the capo uh, of the mafia structure, which centers in the metropolitan New Orleans area and extends into adjoining states. He was very powerful in the gambling business, but that is not to say that he wasn't in the narcotics business, too. 
and he was. He imported heroin, he distributed heroin. His tentacles in gambling particularly reached all the way to Dallas and Houston. Jack Ruby ran a striptease bar in Dallas. But where the Warren Commission would have you believe that's all Ruby did, FBI reports show that Ruby was an important figure in gambling, narcotics, and other rackets. Ruby was described in one FBI document of the late 50s as being uh, heading up a major narcotics operation that ran in Texas, the East, and even into Mexico. This is David E. Scheim, an MIT-trained mathematician whose fascination with the Kennedy case led him to spend 15 years sifting through tens of thousands of pages of raw data, much of it obtained through the Freedom of Information Act. We find he has ties to top mafia people around the country. Uh, Joseph Savillo, the mafia boss of Dallas, an FBI document describes that Ruby is a frequent visitor and associate of Savillo. Just how close was Ruby tied to Savillo's boss, Carlos Marcello? This is Joseph Nellis, Washington lawyer and former counsel to the Kefauver Committee, the first big national investigation into organized crime. Could somebody have operated in the fields of gambling and narcotics in Dallas in uh, the early 1960s without uh, Carlos Marcello saying Not it was okay? Not possible. Not possible, Jonathan. Not without getting a bullet in your head. That's what would have happened to somebody? Absolutely. You had to get permission to operate, permission to kill somebody, permission to break a leg, permission to do anything. Jack Ruby visited Carlos Marcello's brother and underboss in New Orleans just months before the assassination. But Ruby wasn't under the Marcello's thumb alone. It's critical to understand that Ruby was also tied to the Chicago Mafia, which gave Jimmy Hoffa his power. Ruby was born in Chicago and entered the rackets there as a teenager. And among the things he did, uh, according to FBI records, um, he ran errands for the Capone mob, uh, was paid one dollar for every sealed envelope that he was able to transport from one place to another. By 1939, Ruby was helping run a junk handler's union local. Ruby was a suspect in the murder of the local's president, but records of the police investigation have disappeared. Ruby continued at the local under its new mafia-connected boss, Paul Red Dorfman. Now you're talking about a very significant figure in, uh, in the Teamsters history. Red Dorfman was a local Chicagoan who handled all of the insurance placed by the Teamsters Pension Fund and by their other fund activities. In other words, he was collecting premiums on millions upon millions of dollars. Well, the Dorfmans were longtime associates of Mr. Hoffa. Uh, they certainly had uh, very close links to organized crime in Chicago and elsewhere and uh, Mr. Hoffa made arrangements that they receive certain plum type insurance uh, uh, contracts dealing with the pension fund and what have you which were very lucrative. There was a sweetheart arrangement uh, between the Dorfman agency and uh, uh, Jimmy Hoffa that uh, did well for both of them. I'm sure that I'm not exaggerating it one bit when I say that Jimmy Hoffa counted himself one of Red Dorfman's best friends. But Ruby's ties to Hoffa were not just indirect through the Dorfmans. The shocker is that Ruby knew Hoffa himself. Author Dan Moldea, who was the first to publicly assert that the Mafia killed Kennedy, was stunned some years ago when Hoffa's son told him that Jimmy Hoffa had known Ruby since 1939. The son, James Hoffa Jr., a respected Detroit lawyer, then tried to put the remark off the record, so Moldea confirmed it by tape recording a phone conversation between them. And so I turn on the tape recorder, and on tape, Hoffa admitted it again, that his dad was a friend of, uh, that his friend was a Jack Ruby. Well, you told me that uh, your father knew Jack Ruby, but you know, I, was, I remember you said, so what? Uh, he 1939. Knew. He was the kind of guy everyone knew. 1939. Oh, that's when he knew him? Back when he was working with Dorfman? Well, I don't know where he was working with, but he was in Chicago in 39. Yeah, he was working for Dorfman. 
Ruby's work for the Teamsters and the Chicago Mafia continued and naturally came to the attention of the Kefauver investigation in 1950. Remember, the Warren Commission painted Ruby as just a local punk. We're not interested in local crime or in statewide crime. It had to have an interstate aspect in order for federal jurisdiction to be appropriate. And Ruby's name cropped up in a number of hijackings some of which were minor and some of which were or some of which were rather major. He was a member of a group that had ties in Detroit and in Cleveland, Ohio, and to some extent in Florida. So among the others that we grabbed in that dragnet, his name came up. And uh, we interrogated him, as a matter of fact, uh, very briefly to establish the interstate connection not dreaming, of course, uh, who he would become or what he would become. Nellis discussed other businesses Ruby was in, such as distributing items to bars and stores. I asked if that was a mob-controlled racket. Well, if Ruby had it, it was, because I'm sure, as I sit here, that he never did a thing around Chicago without approval from somebody higher up. The Chicago mob's biggest racket in the 50s and 60s was Jimmy Hoffa and the Teamsters. It would be hard to overstate the evil they represented. Hoffa controlled the union's multi-billion dollar worker pension funds. Borrowing money from the funds and not paying it back was a big source of mob income. The amounts of the loans were in the hundreds of millions of dollars, but the tracing of the so-called kickbacks from those loans to Mr. Hoffa and his co-defendants, I would say, would be termed in the, in the millions. I asked Joe Nellis about Hoffa's and the Dorfman's use of violence. Well, Jonathan, let me say this. Uh, violence and enforcement uh, were part and parcel of the uh, operations of the Teamsters with their connections to organized crime beginning long before the Kefauver investigation. Murder certainly was a major weapon, especially where there was a close daily tie between the local and the local Teamsters Union and the local gangs. Senator John F. Kennedy joined the Senate's second big organized crime investigation, the McClellan Committee, in 1957. His brother Robert became chief counsel. They were revolted by the violence and corruption they saw in the nation's largest union, and the Kennedys singled out Hoffa as a target. It, uh while leaving the hearings after these people had testified regarding this matter, did you say that SOB, I'll break his back? Who? You. After to who? To anyone. Did you make that statement after these people testified before the committee? I never talked to you. What am I have to talk to? No, I'm not talking to about uh, to them. Did you make that statement You're here in the hearing room after the testimony was finished? Not concerning them, far as I know of. Well, who did you make it about? I don't know. Then? I may have been discussing somebody in a figure of speech. Well, who did you make the statement? Whose back were you going to break? I don't even remember it. Well, whose back were you going to break, Mr. Hoffa? They gave his speech. I don't even know who I was talking about, and I don't know what you're talking about. This was hardball against organized crime. Bob Kennedy and John Kennedy hated the mafia all out of proportion, and the mafia hated them right back. Did Hoffa ever become an obsession for Bobby Kennedy? I think it goes all the way, I think the answer is yes, but I think it goes all the way back to Mr. Kennedy's dealings with the McClellan Committee, when he was on the McClellan Committee, and they investigated the Teamsters and Mr. Hoffa. And I think he felt that this was a man that had violated state and federal law with impunity, and that uh, no local prosecutor was big enough to really take on Mr. Hoffa. I might say that in connection with the investigation of the Teamsters Union, Mr. Hoffa particularly, a great deal of evidence was developed indicating uh, violent beatings and uh, terrorism in connection with those who had opposed uh, uh, the uh, international president of the Teamsters Union. There was a te testimony developed eventually in connection with uh, threats against me and uh, against my family. Jack Ruby, meanwhile, had moved to Dallas, one of Carlos Marcello's towns. He later said he was on assignment from the Chicago Mafia, which had close and friendly relations with Marcello. He said that uh, he was told to go down there, indicating that the underworld connections in Chicago had led him to, to go to Dallas 
to go into the nightclub business there. The sheriff of Dallas at the time, Sheriff Guthrie, testifies that Ruby came down to Dallas with about 20 thugs and hoodlums in the city. This was at the time when the mob came down to take over the Dallas rackets. What relations did the Chicago mob have with Dallas, with Carlos Marcello in, in New Orleans? Excellent. Oh, now you're talking about one of the key facets of the Kefauver investigation. Uh, one of the chief um, focus of our investigation was to determine the interconnection with one gang and another. It turns out that the Chicago mob, above all, I'm talking about Tony Accardo, Sam Giancana, and before him, uh, Al Capone, were the most active in arrangements with other mobs in other cities. Ruby soon became involved in the Cuban gambling and vice operations of Marcello's friend, Florida Mafia boss Santos Traficante. According to records and corroborated testimony, when a triumphant Fidel Castro jailed Traficante and others in 1959, Ruby offered $25,000 to an arms supplier of Castro's for help springing the prisoners. Ruby dashed to Cuba twice, his fare paid by a gambling operative of Traficante's. Four days after the Kennedy assassination, the CIA learned from a reliable witness that Ruby had personally visited Traficante, a ranking mafia godfather, in his Cuban jail. Clearly, Ruby's ties to the Mafia weren't just marginal, as the Warren Commission suggested. He was exactly the sort of person to be assigned an important and risky mission, and he was not the sort of person who would have suddenly shot Oswald in sorrow for the Kennedys. But one even more shocking fact was completely ignored by the Warren Commission. Lee Oswald, the one other person we know was plotting murder in Dallas that weekend, also was connected to the Carlos Marcello Mafia organization. Oswald's uncle, Dutz Murrett, who brought Oswald up as a father, Oswald's own father having died in infancy, uh, worked in the Marcello organization. He was a bookmaker and, according to reports, knew Marcello personally. Uh, Oswald was quite close to this Marcello-affiliated uncle during 1963, saw him many times. Oswald was associated in various degrees. Um, with at least six members of the Marcello organization. With uh, David Ferry, who worked for Marcello's lawyer, for Guy Bannister, and a private investigator who did work for Marcello, and knew Oswald and knew Ferry. And Ferry was working just about on a daily basis for Carlos Marcello in the fall of 63. He was working uh, on a criminal case that Marcello was involved in. Unquestionably, the Marcello criminal organization was well aware of the existence of Lee Harvey Oswald in New Orleans in the spring and summer of 1963. Oswald operated a highly suspicious one-man pro-Castro organization in a small office building occupied by other men who were all outspokenly anti-Castro. Two of those men, pilot David Ferry and former FBI agent Guy Bannister, worked for Carlos Marcello, who despised Castro. Oswald had previously known Ferry as leader of an air cadet group Oswald had joined in high school. Oswald, unlike Jack Ruby, was not a career mobster. He was a kid who had already compiled a record that could be viewed as kooky, having shot himself once to avoid an unwanted transfer in the Marine Corps and slashed his wrists to avoid deportation from the Soviet Union, where he had defected. Adding now to this kooky image by handing out pro-Castro leaflets, he was the perfect actor for the role of Patsy in an occasionally used mafia murder scenario. Ron Goldstock, one of America's most successful mob prosecutors, compares it to the way New York mafia boss Joe Colombo was shot at a televised public rally a few years after the Kennedy assassination. The killing of Colombo was done in such a way that the killer himself was immediately assassinated. And the, and the person who assassinated the killer then got away. And the killer of Colombo was not a mafia guy. He, he was a, a criminal who... That's right. He was, a, he was a fringe person, somebody who uh, they might be able to dupe into the actual killing, uh, whether he knew what he was doing and why or, or not. Uh, the same thing may be true of Oswald. 
Further diverting investigators from the Marcello connection were Oswald's brushes with U.S. intelligence in the Marines as a radar operator at a base for top secret U-2 spy flights over the Soviet Union. He worked around CIA people, which made it even more suspicious that he learned Russian and defected to the USSR. His way in and out of Russia was surprisingly well greased, suggesting possible participation in one of many U.S. spy programs of the time, described by former CIA officer Victor Marchetti. Everything suggests that he was involved in some sort of an intelligence program, probably sent over as bait in the hopes that he could either penetrate or be picked up uh, by, the, uh, by the KGB and uh, doubled. Well, but of course not really being doubled. On his return home, Oswald was close to at least one person who had been involved in U.S. intelligence operations, all prompting suggestions that the CIA killed President Kennedy, even though there's no evidence of it, and no one has suggested that Jack Ruby was CIA. To create a motive for the CIA, history has been revised to say that Kennedy was going to pull out of Vietnam and make peace with Castro. In fact, however, the very month President Kennedy was killed, he had ordered a coup in Vietnam that only deepened American involvement there. And records show that literally to the day of the assassination, the Kennedys continued to encourage plots to assassinate Castro and sabotage the Cuban economy. The CIA lacked a motive. Nor would Castro or Khrushchev likely have risked World War III to make Lyndon Johnson president. Though accusations have been made, congressional investigators expressly exonerated Castro in the assassination. Only one group had anything big to gain by replacing Kennedy, and it had everything to gain. There are a number of different areas in where uh, action is uh, needed. I think that uh, in the uh, field of organized crime, I think it's a very serious situation that's facing the country at the present time. Bobby Kennedy, when he had joined the Justice Department, revitalized the organized crime and racketeering section. He had been counsel to the McClellan Committee on which Jack Kennedy had sat as a senator. He recognized the danger of organized crime in this country, and he was really the first attorney general to do so in a, in a vigorous way. He brought together some of the best and the brightest people to work in that Justice Department. He had the FBI working with um, lawyers, going out different parts of the country, conducting investigations, prosecutions, and they were beginning to make a difference. Bobby Kennedy, demonstrating his relentlessness, developed a source within the underworld, a person who later turned state's evidence, that was Joe Valachi. And Joe Valachi he went public in, I think, uh, the fall of 1963, testifying about who killed who, who did what to whom, and he was a, a soldier. He was an actual made member, a soldier within the, within the uh, Vito Genovese family, and was responsible for putting a lot of people in jail. Bobby Kennedy was probably the best crime fighter this country's ever had. He was the roughest on organized crime, and as attorney general, he was eating mob guys for breakfast. Under President Johnson and defense-oriented Attorney General Ramsey Clark, the war on the Mafia predictably cooled off. Beyond the benefits reaped by the Mafia in general on Kennedy's death, two men in particular had faced ruin if the Kennedys had stayed in office, Carlos Marcello and Jimmy Hoffa. During the time of the Bay of Pigs invasion, Bobby Kennedy had authorized the literal kidnapping of Marcello off of New Orleans Street, put him on a private plane at the airport, and, and sent him to Guatemala. Bobby Kennedy went on record as saying, I want to be remembered as the guy who broke the mafia. In particular, he was incensed, he was enraged over Marcello's defiance of his deportation. Marcello had re-entered the country illegally, surreptitiously, about two months after Bobby Kennedy had deported him. The Kennedys kept after Marcello, who was on trial the very day the shots were fired that removed Kennedy from office, saving Marcello's career. Hoffa faced the same problem. In his case, the charges ultimately cost him his career, but in 1963, ridding himself of his obsessed prosecutor may well have seemed his only way out, and he said as much to Grady Parton, a Louisiana Teamster leader who later turned government witness against Hoffa. Parton told me that he had, that Hoffa became outraged with Bobby Kennedy. He was going to firebomb his house. He was going to hit his house with plastic explosives at Hickory Hill, Virginia, burn the house down, kill Bob Kennedy, kill Ethel Kennedy, kill the entire family. And Ed Parton said, listen, Jim, if you're going to kill Bob Kennedy, go ahead, kill Bob Kennedy, but don't kill his family. And, uh, and Hoffa replied, no, it, it, to hell with them. They're Kennedys. I want them all dead. 
Hoffa and Marcella were particularly close to each other. The inter-involvement of Hoffa and Marcello uh, was a very close one. For one thing, when uh, Jimmy Hoffa was on trial in Tennessee, and during one of the recesses, uh, Jimmy Hoffa came up to the assistant district attorney, asked about his friend uh, uh, Carlos Marcello, and then asked the assistant district attorney to be sure to let, to remind uh, Carlos Marcello that he had asked for him. There are numerous actions of Ruby, Marcello, and Marcello's agents in the months before the assassination, even in the days before, that suggest their involvement in a criminal conspiracy. The record shows that Ruby made a visit to New Orleans, saw Frank Caracci, who was, uh, who was lieutenant to Carlos Marcello. He made a phone call to Nafia Pecora, another Marcello lieutenant convicted of uh, a drug offense. Pecora called Ruby back. His phone records show calls to people like uh, Barney Baker, a uh, top Teamster thug. During the weeks and months and days, and actually hours before um, the president's murder, Ruby received numerous telephone calls from some very interesting people. Some people who were very, very close to Jimmy Hoffa, including Murray W. Miller, the number two man in the Teamsters Union behind Hoffa. Uh, Barney Baker, Hoffa's number one leg breaker out of Chicago, three telephone calls to and from Baker. These are only part of Ruby's calls and visits, as revealed by telephone company and hotel records. He met Pete Marcello, Carlos's brother and colleague, at the New Orleans bar that served as Pete Marcello's headquarters. And the weekend of the assassination, David Ferry, Marcello's personal aide and Oswald's friend, made a highly suspicious trip to Texas and driving through a storm-swept night to Houston on what he said was a hunting trip. Instead, witnesses say, he spent almost his entire time making and receiving calls from pay booths in Houston. He lied about it to the FBI, which learned, among other things, that he had neglected to take a gun on the hunting trip. Ferry was actually arrested in connection with the Kennedy assassination the following Monday, but the charges were dropped and he died suddenly and suspiciously just as another investigation was getting underway. Ruby also spent the weekend suspiciously, viewing the assassination from atop the plaza where it occurred, following the president to the hospital and then stalking Oswald and talking with a stripper, Karen Carlin, whose sudden need for $25 Sunday morning was the cover story for Ruby's visit to the Western Union office across from the police station where he shot Oswald, supposedly on the spur of the moment. Ruby supposedly received a tele telephone call from Karen Carlin at 1019 Sunday morning. An hour before he kills Oswald. Right, in which she asked to borrow $25. And the she lives uh, down the road. In right, it's not, it's not a big distance. And Ruby, the story is Ruby then left, uh, drove down and sent the telegram, and four minutes later happened to saunter down to the police building and shoot Oswald. This is David Bellin, former counsel to the Warren Commission. Bellin argues that Ruby's shot at Oswald couldn't have been premeditated precisely because of the Karen Carlin alibi, that Ruby was home getting her phone call when Oswald was scheduled for transfer. The reason that Ruby had an opportunity to kill Oswald, Ruby happened to be downtown by happenstance on Sunday morning to wire some money to one of his employees. His restaurant had been closed. Ruby was in the Western Union office. The time stamp was 1117. Oswald was killed at about 1121. Uh, Ruby walked down a ramp leading to the basement where press people were waiting for Oswald to be transferred from the Dallas police jail to the county jail. A postal inspector by the name of Holmes decided instead of going to church that morning to stop in and help his friend Captain Will Fritz at the interrogation sessions of Oswald. Fritz was interrogating Oswald along with representatives of the Secret Service and the FBI. And Fritz invited Holmes into those interrogation sessions. If Holmes would have just gone on to church that morning, he would not have added a half hour or more to the interrogation of Oswald, and Oswald would have been transferred long before Ruby ever got downtown. The fact is that 
Ruby was not in his apartment during the time of the call. Three journalists and a policeman saw Ruby pacing and back and forth in front of that police building from 8 o'clock that morning. A cleaning woman who called Ruby that Sunday morning got a man. She didn't recognize his voice. He had no, no knowledge of her or their weekly cleaning arrangement. When Karen Carlin was first questioned by the Secret Service about the assassination, as the agent reported, she was terrified. She was so terrified she could barely speak. When she finally spoke, as we see in the Secret Service report, she said she believed there was a conspiracy by Oswald, Ruby, and others to kill President Kennedy, and that if she uh, talked, that she would be killed. A few months after the assassination, Karen Carlin was shot to death in a hotel room. There are other eyewitness accounts pointing to a conspiracy. Of course, unreliable witnesses often pop up in highly publicized cases, but these accounts all came at or before the assassination and concern Marcello. One is from Ed Becker, a Las Vegas promoter who had been seeking Marcello's help on a deal and visited the Godfather's vast Mississippi Delta hideaway. Now, I have to be honest, I, I knew who I was talking to. And I think because I was from Las Vegas, he was probably more free with me than he would have been if I was from Washington, D.C. And, uh, and so I started to needle him about being deported. Not in a, you know, not in a, in a way, but in a sort of a, gee, it was sure bad, you know, the Bobby Diddy, you know, da-da-da-da. And he, he picked that up, and that's what happened. He started he start talking about uh, there are ways in taking care of these things, you know, and I'm, I, now I'm interested and I'm going to prompt him, you know. What do you mean, you're going you're gonna to kill him, you know, Bobby? And he says, no, you don't do that. And he says, uh, you cut off the, uh, the head, the tail dies. And that, you know, what does that mean to me, you know? And then a little later on he's saying, you know, this guy's like a, a rock in your shoe, you know. And, you limp long enough, you're going to do something about it. Well, you know, as I say, we're drinking, listening to the music, and having a very good time. And then I, I realized he's very serious. I mean, he's, he's not kidding with me. I've really upset him by even asking these questions, and this is rattling around in his head, and he's, this is the kind of stuff he's, he's giving me. Becker reported this incident to the FBI long before the assassination and before the stone out of the shoe phrase became popularly known as mafia hit talk. A Cuban, Jose Alamon, has testified to a similar story about Marcello's friend Traficanti. And Marcello biographer John Davis uncovered FBI files showing that a Georgia mayor and businessman, Eugene Sumner, actually reported seeing Oswald take a wad of bills from a Marcello underboss at the restaurant Marcello uses as a headquarters in New Orleans. The story is all the more believable because Sumner, in New Orleans for a business trip, apparently didn't know that the restaurant where he was having dinner and the manager he saw hand over the money were connected to the mafia. Only three days after the assassination, he went straight to the FBI. Well, actually, he went to a police officer first, then the FBI, and, and told the whole story. They then sent him photographs of Lee Harvey Oswald, and he verified that that was the man he saw in Marcello's headquarters. The FBI never followed up the Sumner report, and Sumner refuses to discuss it now. And there is still more evidence that requires us to think in terms of a conspiracy. Compelling evidence that a fake Oswald was busy creating a phony image for the real Oswald as a left-wing nut. The Warren Commission used the left-wing nut image in concluding Oswald was the lone assassin. It cited, among other things, a trip Oswald made to Mexico City two months before the assassination, in which he made himself highly visible at the Cuban and Soviet embassies. An investigator for the House Assassinations Committee, Edwin Lopez, pried loose the CIA's photographic records of everyone who entered or left the Cuban embassy in Mexico City, matching the strips of negatives against time logs on all three cameras at the embassy. He found no Oswald. I'm a lawyer. I like to see evidence. And the evidence that we had was that there was no photograph. And if we had no photograph there and we had the negatives so that they had not been, it wasn't like someone had cut up and said between this time and this time we're going to reinsert them and retape them, etc. I mean, we had the photos there. You had the strips of the negatives. The strips of negatives. Um, 
there we had just to, one whole strip that was uh, eliminated. There could have been, but everyone that we spoke to in Mexico City and outside told us there were only three cameras. And we had the scripts for all cameras. But the most persuasive evidence of a false Oswald comes from J. Edgar Hoover himself. Through the efforts of Marcello biographer John Davis, we have obtained this astounding secret memo Hoover wrote to the head of the Secret Service, a memo never shown to the Warren Commission. The key paragraph says the FBI itself concluded that the visitor to the Soviet embassy, identifying himself as Lee Harvey Oswald, was not, in fact, Lee Harvey Oswald. Two Oswalds mean one thing, a conspiracy. But Hoover never told the Warren Commission. It took until the late 1970s for the House Assassinations Committee to begin to discover the mafia links to the JFK assassination. The House Committee's last report suggested a mafia plot, but was carefully hedged and ultimately collapsed in a dispute over acoustical testing. But the committee pointed the way for new discoveries by Scheim, Davis, and others. Why didn't the Warren Commission report the relationships and activities that indicate a mafia conspiracy? Because the people the commission was counting on to give it the facts, FBI Chief J. Edgar Hoover and CIA Chief Alan Dulles, not to mention Attorney General Robert Kennedy himself, all had to cover up the facts. All three men knew that the Kennedys had approved Castro assassination plots and were determined to keep that secret. They also knew that the plots had involved mafia elements close to Marcello. A thorough investigation might turn this up. CIA chief and Warren Commission member Alan Dulles not only had the Castro secrets to protect, he may also have known that his agency used Oswald to spy on the USSR. It would have meant big trouble for either the spying itself or the link with Oswald to become known. Hoover, who controlled most of the commission's information flow, had still other motives. Hoover basically, he never thought that the mafia existed in this country. As a consequence, the FBI, which was more interested in the Red Scare and the witch hunts and the commie bashing, they were very much a part of the movement to move the attention away from the Keefe Offer Committee and, and organized crimes and syndicate crime and to move it into the witch hunts of the House Un-American Activities Committee and the Joe McCarthy hearings of the early 1950s. Robert Kennedy time and again chewed out J. Edgar Hoover for not getting the information on Carlos Marcello and his organization that he wanted. Okay, so if allegations come in linking Carlos and Marcello to the assassination, that was the last thing J. Edgar Hoover ever wanted to hear. If it could have been shown that Carlos Marcello and, or members of his organization were involved in the assassination, it would have totally destroyed his reputation. For everyone, including President Johnson, who wanted to get the country past the affair as soon as possible, the lone nut theory was convenient. Nicholas Katzenbach, running justice in Robert Kennedy's absence, signed off on that conclusion literally before the president had been buried. Alan Dulles promoted that idea at the Warren Commission's first meeting. Yet 25 years later, Aaron Cohn, one of the nation's most respected lawmen, says this regarding Carlos Marcello and the Kennedy assassination. One of the toughest things to do in our society is to make people recognize that the old idea about anyone alleging guilt by association has to be waived when you start talking about the conspiracies of organized crime, because organized crime is crime by association. That I believe that there was an adequate basis in the, fi the official findings to, uh, to justify uh, an ultimate indictment uh, uh, by a grand jury, since I believe that there were the in necessary ingredients of a conspiracy, two, two or more people involved, and at least one overt act. There is no statute of limitations on homicide. Godfather Marcello is now 78 years old. I remain skeptical that the criminal test of beyond a reasonable doubt could be met so long afterwards. But it does seem that the preponderance of the evidence, the standard for civil court juries, indicates a mafia conspiracy to kill President Kennedy. Two of our guests here in the studio agree with Aaron Cohn that a grand jury should meet and indict. They are John Davis, author of the new Marcello biography, Mafia Kingfish, and David Scheim, author of Contract on America. 
And we are joined by David Bellin, counsel to the Warren Commission, whose new book is Final Disclosure, The Full Truth About the Assassination of President Kennedy, which also contains startling new information about Kennedy's foreign policy. And in Washington, Senator Arlen Specter, another former Warren Commission counsel. Senator, have you written a book? No, no, I haven't written any book. I'm just here uh, gratis. That's terrific. Yeah. Okay. Uh, David Bellin and Senator Specter, let's start with you, David Bellin. I saw you taking notes during the tape you just saw. Well, I took notes because I was so disappointed that a person as sophisticated as you, uh, Mr. Quitney, has uh, fallen hook, line, and sinker for the central thesis uh, of uh, books of fiction, such as... Uh, uh, the Mafia conspiracy books that the Mafia was involved in the assassination of President Kennedy. Whenever you have claims of conspiracy, you have to go to the central thesis of the claim and you have to apply two things. First is you have to take a look at the heart of the evidence and the second thing you have to do is apply some common sense. Now the practical claims that uh, the Mafia conspiracists make are that Jack Ruby was conspiratorially involved because Jack Ruby killed Oswald and he was therefore some kind of a hitman from the Mafia. You first start with a question of common sense. Mafia hitmen do not go ahead and kill their targets when they're surrounded by the police, when they're sure to be apprehended and incarcerated in a jail and face life imprisonment or possible death. What about the Joe Bill Colombo case? Uh, uh, apart, from, apart from that practical situation, you have the happenstance of Jack Ruby being downtown in Dallas at the time that he shot Lee Harvey Oswald. There is another reason that Ruby was not conspiratorially involved, and this is something that Senator Specter may want to comment on. But against the advice of Ruby's own attorneys, uh, Ruby demanded that he take a lie detector test, a so-called lie detector test, a polygraph examination, and in fact did take that examination. And in fact, according to the expert who, uh, who was questioning uh, Jack Ruby, Ruby truthfully answered all questions uh, concerning uh, the assassination and the possibilities of conspiracy. Uh, including questions that was, were asked, uh, was he conspiratorially involved? No. Why did he shoot uh, uh, Lee Harvey Oswald to save uh, Mrs. Kennedy the ordeal of coming back to Dallas to have to testify in a trial? And the very fact that Ruby would ask to take a polygraph exam is independent evidence of, the, of his innocence of conspiracy. Another practical aspect, which has never been discussed in Mr. Scheim's book or by the House Assassination Committee, was that Rabbi Hillel Silverman, who was Ruby's rabbi, who intimately uh, knew Ruby, visited with him in his cell in Dallas several times a week until the time in the following <coughs> July when, uh, uh, when Rabbi Silverman left Dallas to accept another pulpit. Rabbi Silverman was absolutely convinced of the innocence of Ruby so far as any conspiracy is concerned. Now, it is true that there are some witnesses, as you indicated in the earlier uh, film introduction to this discussion, which to be candid, I thought was really uh, not fairly presented because it just presented one side of the story without the other. Uh, but it is true. But you're as you, here, and that's uh, it, glad it, of it. it. Well, I trust that uh, Senator Specter and I will therefore have the primary amount of time in this oral discussion. Uh, but it's true, uh, as you pointed out, that when and, and trial lawyers know that whenever you have witnesses to an accident, to any sudden event, you're going to get different stories. And it's true that there are some people that claimed that they saw uh, Jack Ruby uh, in and around the police station uh, earlier that morning. Uh, the fact is that if Jack Ruby were going to go ahead and stay around there to make sure that he was going to get Oswald, he would not have left the police station to go and send a wire uh, uh, in the Western Union office uh, because in no event would someone know exactly uh, when Oswald was coming down. Let the David Scheim reply to Let me tell you, the police, uh, Lieutenant Revel, had so many witnesses who placed Ruby wandering around the police uh, station that he said he didn't even need Rushing's testimony. And the whole crux of the issue with whether Ruby was convicted on first-degree murder was that his alibi was false. It was a premeditated murder. This is what the, ju uh, the jury found. May I Senator Specter, make that last what, remark of uh, Mr. Scheim? Briefly, but then I, I want Senator Specter to speak up. The, the police officer in 
charge of basement security, Patrick Dean, was so close to the Marcello organization that when uh, Marcello's deputy in Dallas came back from the Appalachian crime conclave, the first thing he did was to have dinner with Patrick Dean, with, with, um, with uh, Sergeant Patrick Dean. So you're suggesting right. a man like Dean might have been uh, willing to tip off Ruby. Senator Specter, what do you remember of Ruby's testimony and what do you make of whether he could have been downtown on Sunday morning waiting to shoot Oswald? What I recall of Ruby's testimony was that he flatly said he was not involved in a conspiracy and that he passed a lie detector test. When we deal with the question of whether Ruby broadly hinted at a conspiracy, I saw that comment made in Mr. Shine's book at page three, and I went back and checked the transcript carefully, and it simply isn't so. It was taken out of context. The investigations which have been conducted on the assassination of President Kennedy, and there have been many, many, simply do not support any theory of a conspiracy or any proposition that the Mafia was involved in an assassination. When you asked me earlier if I had written a book, I said, no, I have written no book for profit, but what I might have pointed out was that I participated in writing one book. It's called the Warrant Commission Report, which has been read by virtually no one. And in this book, from pages 243 to 423, there is a detailed analysis of the investigation of possible conspiracy. And the conclusion was, no evidence of a conspiracy. My reading of the, the report was that Ruby's lie detector test was inconclusive. But I want to ask you, if you were aware at the time of the commission that there had been, that J. Edgar Hoover himself had concluded that a, an imposter had identified himself as Lee Harvey Oswald six or eight weeks before the assassination at the Soviet embassy. And if you had been aware that the CIA photographs of everyone entering the Cuban embassy uh, showed that the person identifying himself as Lee Oswald and raising somewhat of a ruckus when they turned him down as a visa was an imposter, wouldn't that in have indicated a conspiracy and would that have changed any of your investigation? Well, I did not know of that specific uh, issue or allegation. Doesn't that show that there was a conspiracy? Uh, no, not necessarily. And I think that there uh, had been uh, materials kept from the commission. Uh, but I, I would point to Mr. Davis's prologue in response to this question as to what the commission did and how much we relied on Hoover. Uh, we conducted an independent investigation and this investigation was conducted by people outside of government, went to the Chief Justice of the United States, to John McCloy, and to others of independence, and went all around the country to find young lawyers who had no association with the government. Uh, David, I should say younger lawyers, David Bellin of uh, uh, Des Moines, Arlen Specter in Philadelphia, from uh, Chicago, from Los Angeles. And Mr. Davis, in his introduction, says that the commission was a collective one of cowardice, ignorance, self-deception, and naive acceptance of the gospel according to Hoover. And the fact is, we weren't. We conducted an independent investigation, and we differed in many respects from what uh, the FBI had concluded. And I think we found uh, the real facts, and certainly no one in the intervening 25 years has disproved our basic conclusions. Could I respond to that? Sure. Yes, uh, what I was driving at in that introduction of Mr. Scheim's book, and which I go into it um, con at considerable length in my own book, is that the Warren Commission simply did not receive adequate information suggesting the possibility of a conspiracy involving organized crime. And I can give you some examples. Uh, we have already mentioned that David Ferry, an associate of Oswald and also of Carlos Marcello, was arrested two days after the assassination. The FBI conducted a very thorough investigation of David Ferry, and they found very, very many uh, suspicious things about him. The information on Ferry and the reports, the FBI reports on Ferry, never even arrived at the Warren Commission. You didn't even see them. I also uncovered documents suggesting the possible involvement of the Marcello organization in the assassination, which never, uh, these came into the FBI, these allegations came into the FBI about three or four days after the assassination. They never got to the Warren Commission. We could go on. 
there were, uh, uh, as we know, there were very, very um, unsavory plots uh, on the part of the CIA in alliance with the mafia to assassinate Fidel Castro, which Robert Kennedy as Attorney General knew about, which the uh, director of the FBI, Ted Hoover, knew about, uh, which Alan Dulles, who sat on the Warren Commission, knew about. These were never given to the Commission. The Commission knew nothing about them. They were never informed. Senator, were you aware of Lee Oswald's ties to the same criminal organization in New Orleans uh, that Jack Ruby was tied to? Were you aware of the Mafia assassination plot? The answer is no, uh, I was not, but let me hasten to add that that was not my area of responsibility. I have not had an opportunity to read Mr. Davis's book, although I tried to do so before this program. I hurriedly read Mr. Shine's book. But what I have seen in uh, the cuts which you sent me, and in Mr. Shine's book, and I think in Mr. Davis's book, but I can't be sure because I haven't read it, are snatches of a little fact here and there, uh, which really add up to nothing. On the materials that I know about in detail, as to the trajectory of the bullets, of the direction of the shots, Mr. Shine is simply categorically wrong. That's okay. what Senator Specter just said. He said that uh, David Shine is so wrong, uh, his credibility uh, uh, is so subject to question on these basic facts that therefore, when he's so wrong on these basic facts, you have to assume that he's also wrong on putting together the little bits and snatches. I, I have to respond. You to, have to respond I, to I've that. Been, I've been attacked by two, by two people. No. Let me say, first of all, the Senate Intelligence Committee reviewed the Warren Commission's performance in 1976. The, uh, the, the committee found from memos from Hoover and Johnson that there was predetermined instructions that Oswald was the lone assassin. Uh, Bert Griffin was the staff member in charge of Jack Ruby. He was not allowed to go to Jack Ruby's testimony. Griffin stated, I feel betrayed. Evidence was withheld from me. Jack Ruby gave a canned alibi. Ruby asked for the polygraph test to get another chance for contact with federal officials. One final thing, just that you neglect to mention, is uh, as News Newsweek disclosed, Ruby wrote a note from his jail cell stating to his lawyer, Joe Tonahill, Joe, you should know this. Uh, my other lawyer, Tom Howard, told me to make up the story that I shot Oswald uh, so that Mrs. Kennedy wouldn't go to trial. His, Ruby's alibi is obviously preposterous. Given his background, over 100 witnesses saying that he had close mob ties and a significant mob position, the whole thing is preposterous. Mr. Sham, do you think that Lee Harvey yeah, Oswald... May respond to that? Sure. Yes, sure. Senator ahead, Speck, we are not going to settle Ruby's story by picking a piece here and a piece there. Uh, the only way people will understand it is if they go to the transcript that took about two hours. I was present for part of it. If they go to the lie detector test and if they read that, I was present for all of that. And they will see in a total context, I believe, uh, that Jack Ruby was telling the truth, that he was not involved in a conspiracy uh, with Lee Harvey Oswald. When we have a piece picked here and a piece picked there and a piece picked somewhere else, and it is simply not possible for me to know all those details for, for many reasons. It was outside of my narrow scope. Some things were not given to the Warren Commission. Uh, but when you take a look at all of them on the extracts that I saw before this program started, they simply uh, don't amount to anything. You say, Mr. Quitney, uh, that they uh, would uh, establish beyond the preponderance of the evidence. Well, I flatly disagree with you. Uh, Senator, doesn't uh, the existence of an Oswald imposter indicate that someone else was conspiring for what he did? Well, I do not know the details of the allegation as to an Oswald imposter. Uh, but I do know that the Warren Commission turned over every stone and found no conspiracy. Did you I, investigate what David Ferry was doing on the weekend? He said he was going hunting, but in fact uh, took no gun, and witnesses said he was making uh, phone calls and receiving well, them from pay booths. I did not, because that was not my area of responsibility, but there were other competent investigators who did, and since that time, that ground has been reviewed by many, many, many investigators, and including the House Committee, and all have found no evidence of a conspiracy except for the acoustical evidence, which has since been totally discredited by the National Academy of Science. Well, the chief counsel to the House Committee said there was much other evidence of conspiracy and, in fact, wrote a, a lengthy book about it. 
Well, that's the chief counsel. The House committee, aside from the acoustical evidence, which was discredited, the House committee found no evidence of a conspiracy. Did the commission investigate the conversations that Oswald had with, uh, that, excuse me, that Jack Ruby had with high-ranking Teamster and Mafia people uh, in the days and weeks before the assassination and his, his own ties with Jimmy Hoffa and the Teamsters? Well, I do not know the answer to that question, again, because it was not my specific area of responsibility. But competent investigators went over every stone that there was available to us at the time. Does it bother you that Hoover reached conclusions about an Oswald imposter and didn't tell the commission? Yes, it does bother me if that, in fact, happened. As I sit here, I do not know if that happened. but. Uh, we were concerned about what uh, Mr. Hoover was doing. We were concerned about what the CIA uh, was doing. And I believe that even though we did not get the information we should have in some particulars, that we found the correct conclusions. David Senator Bellin's Spector, book, there are FBI reports of the investigation of David Ferry, which J. Edgar Hoover withheld from you and your fellow uh, commissioners and staff members of the Warren Commission. One report indicated that David Ferry, a friend of Lee Harvey Oswald, met with the boss of the Louisiana Mafia the two weekends preceding the assassination. Uh, uh, since uh, the boss of the Louisiana Mafia was a sworn enemy of the Kennedys, since Robert Kennedy had sworn to destroy his power, it should have been significant that a friend of Oswald was meeting with an associate of this Mafia boss. Uh, it was so significant, I believe, that J. Edgar Hoover did not want you to see it, and he withheld it. I have the document. It was never sent to the Warren Commission. It is not among the Commission documents in, in the archives. It was withheld. Well, Mr. Davis, wasn't that made available to the House Committee? It was, and it made the House Committee very suspicious. Uh, well, As okay. a matter of fact, the All House right, Committee... That's the point. That's the point. It may have made the House Committee very suspicious, but the House Committee did not conclude that the Mafia was involved in a conspiracy to kill President Kennedy. It, you said it, that's it not listed that as very close one to One thing it. that Arlen Specter said. Uh, I came to the uh, Warren Commission as an independent young lawyer from Des Moines, Iowa, beholden to no one. Uh, and, and trials, I had always advocated one side or another, but here I was in Washington advocating nothing but the truth. And like Arlen and the other members of the staff, uh, leaving no stone unturned to find the truth. And if you can put yourselves uh, in, our, in our shoes, uh, sure, we had preliminary reports of the FBI, and there were literally hundreds of FBI interviews. And I might add, by the way, many FBI reports were inaccurate. Uh, if you want to go ahead and build a case on a sheaf of inaccurate FBI reports, uh, uh, there are literally uh, hundreds of them. The FBI just sometimes is not accurate when it records information. The Senate Intelligence Committee found that the, war that the FBI and CIA lied to the Warren Commission. The House Select Committee, regardless of what Mr. Spector infers their motives, concluded the murder of President Kennedy was probably a conspiracy, that the Mafia had the motive, means, and opportunity to kill him. Let me quote exactly what that House committee basically said, because I can tell you... Before uh, you read what, from your book, Final Disclosure, let me note that you express outrage in your own book at Alan Dulles, a member of the Warren Commission, not disclosing the uh, Mafia assassination plots that uh, he, he uh, was aware of. You mean against Castro? Yeah. I don't mean the CIA assassination plots, and I also disclose in my book that I was the one that basically uncovered that and brought it to the attention of the Rockefeller Commission. And just as I left no stone yes, unturned did. in my work with the Warren Commission, I left no stone unturned uh, in my work with the Rockefeller Commission investigating the CIA. Why were those plots withheld but from the Warren Commission? There is no excuse By the Attorney for General, by the head of the ex-head of the CIA, and by the head of the FBI. Why were they withheld from you? They must have been relevant. You have just heard a lot of information. There's enough evidence that the documentary segment alone could have run two hours. At the start of the studio discussion, we said we'd keep taping until all the guests decided that they had said their piece, and we did. We've combed the transcript, and a fair statement of every point raised in opposition to our documentary was included in the edited version you just saw. My thanks to all our guests on this program. I'm Jonathan Quitney, and I hope to see you next time on The Quitney Report.